Okay. Oh, alrighty. <laughs> um, do, do, do. If you would like to participate today in the program, uh, please do so in the chat, and we will we will uh, keep an eye on that for for Art. If you have any questions that you'd like to get answered, um, go ahead and click that. So. Welcome to the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. Uh, my name is Carmela. I am the Adult Teen Services Librarian here. Um, we are happy to have our final installment of the Connecticut Innovation and Industry with our Gottlieb. Gottlieb, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, Gottlieb. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> this series is made possible by the Friends of the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. Um, they're always looking for new members to join. So if you would like to uh, join in on that friends group, uh, you can do so on our website at edithwheelermemoriallibrary.org, which is ewml.org. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Arthur Gottlieb. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to him if he's all set. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Unless I'm done terrorizing you about my name. Okay. Oh no, I just have a little issue with um with some pronunciation. So yeah, so do I. So <laughs> go ahead, Art. <laughs> so anyway, folks, how are you? Uh, I'm using a different computer today, so um, I'm not expecting any computer problems, right? I probably just jinxed it now. And uh, we've got a program about Carl Norden, um, and it's about what he was most famous for developing, um, or at least gets the credit for developing, because they call the Norden bombsite. If you're somebody who's a military buff, you know, you'll know the Norden bombsite. The Norden bombsite is one of the most well-known pieces of hardware that ever existed in any military arsenal. Um, well, not arsenal in the form of a bullet, but something that would make it possible for an actual bomb to hit its target. So I thought carefully about how to do this today. You know, the here in Norwalk, where I am right now, they have Norden Place and they have this whole, you know, uh, park, an industrial park that was Norden Park. And it, it's all referring, of course, to commemorate Carl Norden and the and the famous you know Norden company. Now Norden actually started off in a few different places, um, and its last main address was here in Connecticut, right? And that's why that's on our list. Now I'm going to tell you a story about Carl Norden, and I'm going to go into a different program that's going to explain the Norden bomb site in um, in context. Right, it's a story about World War II um, bombers and, and the central role that the Norden bombsite played. Okay, and it'll give you an understanding of why this piece of equipment was just so absolutely fundamental and remains so in, in a prominent place in our legacy today as far as you know, innovations. Now, I was able to, um, fr frankly, the, the best biography I was able to find on Norden was something that I picked up from something called the, Nor the Norden Retirees Club, right? So, and I'm going to read this to you, and um, normally I wouldn't do something like that, but it's very well written, and it's very succinct, and it's not long, and as long as I'm telling you that I got it from the Norden Retirees Club, then I'm not infringing anybody's... Um, uh, copyright and I'm not plagiarizing, okay? So it is very well written and it's from the inside from people who know Norden and his corporation better than anybody. So uh, I'm gonna read this to you now. I'm just gonna pull one of my lights a little bit closer. Carl Norden was enshrined in the National Aviation Hall of Fame in 1994. The following is a summary of his career as presented in their citation. Carl Lucas Norden was born on April 23rd, 1880 in Samarang, Java. You know what Java is? It's just 
west of Australia, in between Australia and the Malay Peninsula, or where Singapore is. <clears throat> now, Java, which is now part of Indonesia, used to be, by the way, my size to my, uh, Indonesia used to be something called the Dutch East Indies, right? It was a colonial, you know, outpost of the Dutch. And therefore, anybody who lived there was technically Dutch, right? And which was the case for Carl Norden, you see? So he was Dutch, but he actually was born all the way down in, in the Southwest Pacific. So Carl Lucas Norden was born on April 23rd, 1880 in Samang, Java, now Indonesia, the third of five children. Following the death of his father in 1885, the family returns to Holland, then moved to Dresden, Germany in 1885. The family returned to, uh, in 1896, he began a three-year apprenticeship in a Swiss machine shop after which he entered the world famous Zurich Federal Polytechnic School. He graduated as a mechanical engineer in 1904 and came to the United States. Norden worked for two years in the Worthington Pump and Machine Company in Brooklyn and from 1906 to 1911, at the J.H. Lingerwood Manufacturing Company before moving to the Sperry Gyroscope Company. You see now, I don't know if you know what a Sperry Gyroscope is. A Sperry, I, I used to run into these things all the time on, on ships, right? Um, ships that were in service, ships that were out of service. And it is essentially a Sperry Gyroscope is like a compass except it isn't regularly a magnetic compass. It is, on a, uh, it is on a gimbal that's running on a gyroscope, which means that despite whatever movement that a ship might have, right? If it's pitching up and down, if it's yawing left and right, if the ship is actually moving up or down, right? With the waves, this gyroscope would keep the compass card perfectly level for greater accuracy, et cetera, right? <clears throat> and everything else, they used to have repeaters with a slave um, screen of a compass, and those would be called gyro repeaters, right? And uh, so this was a big innovation in navigation. So Norden was in the right place, and you can see the kind of things that he was um, into developing and manufacturing and perfecting and improving. Now, Elmer Sperry hired Norden to help design the first gyro stabilizer, which is basically what I just described, for large ships produced in the United States. While at Sperry, Norden married and brought to America Else Faring, who had met who he, he had met years earlier in Zurich, in 1915, Norden left the Sperry Company to set up his own business. So once again, we have another guy who worked alongside other people, and then decided that he was going to branch out and start his own company. But he continued to work on Sperry's uh, marine stabilizer contracts until 1917. In other words, almost the end of World War I. <clears throat> Norden was, won several patents on control systems for launching aerial torpedoes from ships. He also designed and furnished many instruments and devices for United States Navy bureaus, including robot flying bombs, robot flying bombs. And we're talking about cruise missiles here, right? And this is right after World War I. Uh, yeah, and radio controlled target planes and the catapults and the resting gear used on aircraft carriers. He also worked on a control system for aircraft with others, which was a, which was a precursor of the automatic pilot. Now, in this particular period of time in the 1920s, you know, aircraft were 
They were perfected to a point for use in military operations in World War I, but really nobody knew what to do with airplanes in the 1920s. They weren't flying the mail back and forth yet. And so you had a lot of leftover military hardware and aircraft pilots, and they were doing things like barnstorming. You say, in other words, flying through barns, barnstorming, you know, at county fairs, et cetera. Um, you had all of these people who were involved in that, including Charles Lindbergh, right? But from a military perspective, the airplane was seen as the next big weapon. There was a period of time right after World War I where airplanes were considered the perfect weapon to prevent future wars. Now, how are you going to prevent a war with an airplane? Because with the notion of a potential enemy being bombed relentlessly from the air, they wouldn't dare go to war with you. You see, and we had a similar situation after World War II also, where the Army Air Force, later just to become the Air Force, was saying to Congress, hey, you know, why are you wasting all this money on the United States Army and why are you wasting it on the Navy and the Marine Corps? All you need is an air force because nobody would dare attack us, especially in the age of nuclear weapons. With the threat of us flying over a potential enemy and dropping an atomic bomb on their head, nobody would be stupid enough to go to war with us. You see, so this is a, a real theme that carries through our military uh, fabric. And the 1920s and the 1930s, there was this fervent bunch of people who believed that air power was the future and everything else was a waste of money. Uh, Billy Mitchell is probably exhibit A, right, from the Army Air Corps. And the notion is that there was just tremendous push to build bigger and bigger aircraft so that you can actually use it to drop bombs. Now, the issue of dropping bombs is one that is not an easy thing to do, right? In World War I, they were flying over places and you had a guy standing in the back and he would take, he had a stack of bombs next to him in the cockpit and he would literally pick it up and toss it out the side of the airplane. Okay, is that effective? Uh, maybe for if you wanna terrorize a bunch of people or cows or something in a field, maybe that's effective. But what people had imagined and what they were counting on from technology to produce was the ability to have strategic bombing where you could literally fly over at whatever, 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet, and actually annihilate with reasonable accuracy some target. And that was like a religion in all of the air forces of the world in the 1930s. Who was going to be able to have that kind of accuracy, you see? And Norden was the one who actually developed something that, at least on paper and in legend, created that kind of accuracy in his bomb site, all right? In 1921, Norden began work on an instrument which could drop bombs from an aircraft and hit targets on land or sea. In 1923, Norden and Theodore H. Barth teamed up as partners and over the next four years, Norden worked on the bomb site in Zurich while Barth assembled the parts in the United States. In 1928, they incorporated their company as Carl L. Norden Incorporated with an order for two precision bomb sites. Barth became the president and Norden took on the engineering work. In the first year, the company developed a new bomb site with a timing mechanism to indicate the time to release the bomb. You see, I mean, think about this for a minute. I just gave you an example when on the ship, what you would need to do to counteract the movements of the ship, right, for accuracy. And this is a matter of infinitely variable calculus that we're talking about and trigonometry. How to actually have an aircraft that's moving as, I don't know, let's say the aircraft is moving through the air at 150 miles an hour, right? 
And let's say, for instance, that you're geographically over a target. You see, so in other words, something you want to hit. Now, if you drop the bomb, is being dropped by gravity. So how, where, when do you release the bomb so that when it, by the time it hits the ground, it hits the target, right? So just think about this for a second, right? It's a giant triangle, right? Where the airplane is, where the bomb drops, where the target is, where the target's gonna be, right? Cause you're traveling at 150 miles an hour. And then you got a few other things going on. There's a lot of wind between your aircraft and the ground. What about drift? What about if your airplane is being pushed to the side so your instruments are reading one thing, but really it's something else because your airplane is being pushed to the side. Now, anybody who does any navigation knows what I'm talking about. I used to see this not in airplanes because um, I was never an actual pilot, you know, but I did helm uh, of boats on a regular basis and uh, was responsible for a certain level of navigation. My job really was to keep the course, was to keep the vessel on course, right? Not always as easy as you think. And sometimes you have to crib the nose of the boat or a larger vessel into the current just so you can stay on the vector that you want to be on. You see what I mean? Uh, there's those of you in the audience who are going to know what I'm talking about. And those of you who are wishing I just moved to the next thing. Okay, but this all has to be figured out. Now, we had things in the 1930s that were being developed called analog computers, you see, and um, this is an analog computer. It's like a computer like the one I'm using now and the one that you're using now, except instead of all electronics, it's amazing. It's using gears and it's like a giant switch, Swiss clock. It is absolutely stunning in its innovation, right? Now, the, probably the best example of this kind of technology would be the torpedo data computer on a submarine, right? Where you have a submarine that's pointed in one direction. You've got a ship that's going by in another direction. You're traveling a certain speed. The other ship is traveling a certain speed. You see, you're pointed, the, the, your vessel is pointed at one uh, bearing and the ship is traveling at another bearing. How do you actually fire a torpedo that's going to be moving a specific speed and actually hit the thing? This is not an easy thing to do. It's extraordinarily complicated. And that's what the torpedo did, uh, data computer was for. You cranked in your speed, your direction, the estimated speed, and the bearing of the other ship, the relative bearing to your bow, to the direction the other ship was moving. And you had this computer whizzing away right, with all these little gears and micro motors, and it would actually come up with something called a solution, right? And the solution would automatically be plugged into the torpedo, and the torpedo would actually travel to the target, right, based on the latest information upon the, the point of firing. The Norden bomb site is just that device, except instead of it being on a submarine, it is something that's in an aircraft. And it, principally, it's, its job is to do that. It is to figure out the course of your airplane, the speed of your airplane, um, and all of the other variables, right? How heavy the bomb is, what kind of bomb is it, the weather conditions, all sorts of other variables everything you could possibly imagine. This thing was chewing on to the moment of the bomb release to make sure that, that everything was compensated for. So this essentially thing falling by Newtonian physics, this dumb bomb was going to fly through the air and actually hit what you were trying to hit. That's what this was about. In 1931, Norman demonstrated to the Navy a much improved bombsite in a test against the hulk of a heavy cruiser. Uh, Navy officials were so impressed by its accuracy, they promptly ordered 40 Norden bombsites. The Army Air Corps also placed its order. The Army Air Corps in 1935 installed Norden bomb sites and Martin B-10 bombers 
right, to develop the tactics of high altitude precision daylight bombing. Now, this was something that became a religion in the Army Air Force, right? Or the Army Air Corps, later the Army Air Force, right? If you've ever seen a movie like uh, 12 O'Clock High with Gregory Peck, okay? I mean, we in the 8th Air Force, right, flew out of Great Britain towards Germany, and we flew during the daytime, you see? And we were going to use high altitude precision bombing, right? The British bombed at night, you see? And we were going to use the Norden bomb site to be able to pinpoint targets for maximum military effectiveness, right? To get bombs on target with an acceptable accuracy requires an aircraft to correct for drift while maintaining a constant altitude and airspeed. Even minor fluctuations can cause a miss. And the greater the altitude, the greater the error. To overcome this problem, Norden devised a gyro-stabilized automatic pilot. On the approach to the target, the autopilot would be turned on to reduce turbulence and over controlling by the pilot. You see, by turning the aircraft over to the Norden bomb site, the aircraft would actually be a more stable platform for bombing than if you had human control, which tends to overcompensate from it, you know, for what the airplane's doing. You see? Um, the bombardier would take over and keep the crosshairs of the site centered on a target. At the critical moment, the bombs were released and a green light in the cockpit would flash in the cockpit to tell the pilot that bombs were gone and he could resume control of the aircraft. Remember, this is in like 1935. You, this is going on in a man's head, all of this. And he has that kind of intimate and fluent knowledge of technology to be able to make turn this into a reality. It's incredible. In the succeeding years, the bomb site was approved. The ultimate model designated the Mark 15. That's what we're going to be talking about today. It was a complex assemblage of more than 2,000 cams, gears, mirrors, lenses, and other components, right? It's just amazing. So this goes on here to talk about how great the, the, the Norden bomb site was. And, um, and the fact that it was a top secret, it was, it was as secret as like the Manhattan Project, right? Developing the atomic bombs. It was a big deal, a really big deal because we didn't want this thing to get into the hands of the Germans or something like that. You see the Norden bomb site in every one of our bombers, we had to be careful. If the thing was actually, if you crash landed, the bombardier was sworn that before he took his last breath, he was gonna destroy the Norden bomb site. You see, um, I'm wearing a, one of my military shirts today, right? So it's the USS Shangri-La right, which is a, an aircraft carrier, a Navy aircraft carrier, right? I was in charge of, I wasn't on the Shangri-La, very unusual. All of the shirts I have were ships that I personally worked on. The Shang is different. That's what they call it, the Shang, because I wasn't in charge of, I wasn't on the Shangri-La. I was in charge of what was left of the Shangri-La after they took it apart. And it, the, I used the parts for other aircraft carriers that were being restored across the United States. But anyway, the name of the ship Shangri-La, um, to tell you a story, uh, it, maybe you've heard of the Jimmy Doolittle and the Doolittle Raiders, right? It was the first attack that we had on Japan. And um, there was no, uh, during a time only, well, it was in April, right? So you got what, we were hit on December 7th, 1941, right? So it's January, February, March, April. So four months after Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese control literally almost the entire Pacific Ocean. We hit Tokyo, Kobe, Nagoya with American bombers. 
How is that even possible? We don't have anywhere near a land base that could launch an attack by land bombers on Japan four months after this war started, when the Japanese had complete superiority of the air and the sea. How did that happen? Well, somebody came up with the idea of using not one of the big bombers that we had, like a B-17 or something, but using a smaller bomber, a medium bomber, in this case, a Mitchell B-25. And just so happens that if you outfit a Mitchell B-25 the right way and you fly it the right way, you can actually take off in like 500 feet. See? So what they did was they took, they took these aircraft and then they put them on an aircraft carrier, the USS Hornet, and they sent it out to Japan along with the USS Enterprise, two aircraft carriers that we had at the time. And they made a beeline straight for Japan. You see, now, this was a suicide mission. They were going to take off these army bombers from these ships, one ship, the Hornet. And they were going to do a nuisance raid over Tokyo for psychological effect. In other words, we can get to you if we want. My, the damage was minimal, but the psychological effect of us hitting them was enormous. My psychological warfare is a big, big story. And so we were able to do that. Now, since this was basically a suicide mission, right, because the idea was that you were going to fly over Japan in these B-25s that were going to be low on fuel by that point, then you were just going to skim right over um, and crash land in China someplace. And maybe the Chinese nationalists would find you. But essentially, it was a suicide mission. So you didn't want to crash the airplane and have the Japanese have a hold of the Norden bomb site. You see? So they took all of the Norden bomb sites out of all of these B-25s. And they made this rudimentary thing made out of a couple of pieces of aluminum so that the bombardier can actually just, in, a, in, a, in the most crude sense, site when to release the bombs, right? Now, that's a good example. You don't want this thing falling into the enemy, you see. Now, as far as the Shangri-La is concerned, right after we hit Japan with this, there were 16 B-25 bombers. They launched from approximately 500 miles out. All right, I don't want to tell you the whole story because it's really worth its own presentation. But what happened was we were bragging about the fact, of course, that we hit Japan with army bombers, you see? And it was a top secret thing that we were able to launch these from aircraft carriers because you're not supposed to be able to launch army bombers from aircraft carriers. You see, so President Franklin D. Roosevelt is bragging about the Doolittle raid in front of a bunch of reporters. And the reporters asked the president, but sir, we don't have a base that could launch an army bomber anywhere near Japan, where did the bombers come from? And Roosevelt said, the bombers came from Shangri-La. And to commemorate the Doolittle Raiders, right, the Navy launched a massive aircraft carrier called the USS Shangri-La. And that is the story of the Shangri-La and the Northern Bombsite and the Doolittle Raiders. Hope you enjoyed that. So anyway, um, the Norden bomb site was actually used um, in Korea after World War II. It was used even in Vietnam to bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail, if you can believe that, right, with modern bombers. You see, uh, the Norden bomb site was something that was needed until you had something called guided bombs, where you could actually, with a a signal or a laser, you can actually pinpoint something and then lead a bomb directly to it. Like the kind that we have today that we're flying off of drones and stuff, you see? So, um, production uh, was halted on the Norden bomb site uh, in September, 1945 after 43,292 units had been produced, the Army Air Force had, had procured all except 6,500 of the Norden bomb sites, which were, had been sent to the Navy 
The Northern bomb site was used during the Korean War and on Strategic Command's photo reconnaissance and mapping missions in the early Cold War. Norden was a quiet and unassuming man who was proud that the bomb site could be used for strategically striking military targets while minimizing collateral damage to surrounding civilian populations and structures such as churches, schools, and homes. See, so there's a level of benevolence in this. Norden was proud that he could, during warfare, have provided something that would be effective and hitting the enemy. But one of the goals here was in that accuracy, you wouldn't be killing a bunch of civilians, you see? It is interesting to note that Norden did not make money on the bomb site during the war. Selling his rights to the site to the government for $1. I didn't know that until I read this. Carl Norden returned to Switzerland shortly after World War II and died there in 1965. All right. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you a program that I have on the way that the bomb site was used in World War II. Share screen. Okay, you can see this, right? Just nod. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so anyway, uh, you know, the first thing here about this business of airplanes and, and maybe a lot of things in World War II was, you know, just the incredible youth of so many people that were involved. You know, I mean, I get a picture behind me on my, my uh, bookshelf over there, of my, my dad that was in World War II. And, you know, he was a kid, you know, he was like 16, 17 years old. You know, he lied actually about his age and pulled this string or that string, who knows? But he's like, um, he's a kid. And all of these people are kids. Now, this is uh, what the crew during a briefing of an American bomber would look like over in England. Now, the United States actually came to the game late, as we tended to do with, you know, World War I and World War II. Here in World War II, remember that England had already been at war since September 1939, the United States got invited to the party by the Japanese, as you know, on December 7th, 1941. And then uh, we declared war on them the next day. And then the Germans declared war on us on December 11th, 1941. So anyway, so the, the, the British had already been at it, you see. So when we came over with what was to be the 8th Air Force and um, England uh, in 1942, we didn't actually launch an operational mission, you know, until late summer, right? Because we had to, you know, it's a tremendous infrastructure. We have all of our own hardware. We're using different bullets, different engines, different lubricants, different bombs, right? Different anything, right? And uh, so, but the British had a lot to offer with experience. That happens to be a a Lancaster bomber, which is their equivalent version to like a B-17, right? I'm sure if you asked any Brit, they would tell you that the Lancaster was better than a B-17, but whatever, okay? So here it is, they're preparing these bombs and they're getting ready to hoist them into the aircraft for release. Right, this is an uh, Royal Air Force Lancaster bomber. There's their bombardier, right? And he is looking out and there is a Lancaster bomber uh, dropping what is referred to as a stick of bombs. You see, this is what the whole thing's about. This is what the whole thing's about. You know, if I was talking about naval stuff and I was talking about a battleship, right? The point is how do you get 
those 2,700 pound armor piercing 16 inch in diameter shells to fly 22 miles through the air after they're fired from your big guns and have them actually hit what you're trying to hit. If you can't solve this, then the whole endeavor has no meaning, okay? All you're doing is killing a bunch of cows. Lancaster bomber over a V-1 site in France. Now a V-1 site is the Germans had developed the first, essentially the first cruise missile. It was like a crude cruise missile, it had a jet engine and you, they launched it from a long ramp, right? And it would be carefully measured how much fuel was on board so that this thing would run out of gas right over London, in which point it would point into a deep dive. The wings are designed to tear off and now it's a bomb. And it was called a buzz bomb. Maybe you've heard that phrase before because it had this, the first generation jet engine that the Germans had. It was like a, a pulse engine, right? And so it, it was like essentially it would be off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on. And when it was running, uh, it sounded like, um, when you were a kid, did you ever, on, on your bicycle, did you ever put like a, a playing card right on the side so that when the spokes went by, it actually plucked the playing card and it made that sort of buzzing sound. That's why it was called the buzz bomb. You see, because it sounded like that. So that is what the bomb bay looks like in a, one of these Lancaster bombers. Not unlike what it looks like in the bomber of an American bomber, right? Bombs are bombs, and they're they're dumb bombs. They're they you drop them, and by gravity and Newtonian physics, they do whatever they do from the point of release until they hit whatever they're hitting. You see, these particular bombs have to be happen to be cluster bombs, which means that essentially you've got a bunch of little bombs in here that are filled with later on what we will refer to as napalm. Okay, very nasty. See, and that's what a city looks like after it's been napalmed, right? In World War II, we didn't call it napalm, we called it incendiary bombs. So because the British were flying at night, uh, supposedly they didn't have the accuracy. I'm sure they would disagree with that, but this is all still frankly very controversial, all of it. And you would have a lead plane of the British and they would hit something with incendiary bombs. And then the rest of the bombers would come in and they would aim for what was already burning. And keep in mind that the stuff we're talking about, typically speaking in Germany is, you know, so you have medieval cities that are that, you know, the wood has been there for 500 years, a thousand years, you know, and it's ready to burn, you see. Um, this is in October 15th, 1944. All of this is still actually pretty controversial as far as it's, you know, the ethical nature of it. You see, this carpet bombing technique. But incendiary bombing was, um, it was developed in Europe here. And we took what we learned in incendiary bombing, uh, a, from the British, frankly, and then we incorporated it, incorporated it in Japan, right? So the United States and Europe, it's interesting. In Europe, we usually look, we, the United States, usually look at the Europeans, the British, as the ones who actually, you know, killed a lot of people while they were sleeping in their beds. But then we went around and we used the same technology and the same strategy in Japan. Uh, when we shipped over Curtis LeMay to the Pacific Theater and we were burning Japan from one end to the other, okay? This is not what the Norden bomb site was developed to do, okay? I'm getting to that. Uh, and then of course, you know, while you're flying over Germany, they're not, you know, they're not like waving at you saying, hey, how you doing? They're trying to shoot you the hell down, right? So you have these, the Germans had these very, very good guns. They had 105s, they had 88s, you know, and they had fused shells that would 
actually explode after a certain time in the air, right? You could fuse the shells, right? And that would be determined by their altitude, which was determined by the Germans' radar of where our airplanes were, right? And once they had your altitude, then they just kept shooting at you and either uh, one of these shells would actually hit your airplane or the shrapnel, right? When the thing exploded and broke into parts, would, I don't know, all you have to do is take out an oil line or a gas line or knock out a propeller or something and one of the engines will stop, you know, let alone going right through the fuselage and going right through the back of your neck. It's very nasty business. Germans, like I said, had radar. The Germans were actually flying at night trying to intercept the British with their own drone radar equipped airplanes. Right, here's another British Lancaster. Now, we talked about this a little bit uh, before as far as aircraft production was concerned. You know, you, we had um, B-24 Liberator bombers when we were talking about Pratt and Whitney, et cetera. Um, this was in the Willow Run plant in, um, from Henry Ford. And they produced here in this plant um, and elsewhere where the B-24 was being manufactured under license, uh, almost 19,000 B-24s, uh, just of this one kind of bomber. You know, the B-17 bomber somehow gets the lion's share of glamour in the air war as a bomber, but it was really the B-24 was as much or even more the workhorse of the bomber force. Right now, one of the issues was that the Germans, even in 1944, 1945, to a lesser degree, they were um, intent on shooting us down. Right now, the B-17 bomber was supposed to be so well armed that if you flew a bunch of B-17s in what they call the box, they'd be able to have enough anti-aircraft fire to protect itself. That wasn't the case. The Germans were all too happy to attack our bomber formations during the daytime, that's us, and uh, shoot as many bombers down as they could. So the idea was that you should really escort our bombers with our own fighter planes. So when the Germans showed up, our fighter planes would take on the German fighter planes and then the bombers could concentrate on what they were doing, right? Which is dropping bombs. But that was problematic because the aircraft that we had as fighter planes used up a prodigious amount of fuel and you can't get all the way to Germany or half the way to Germany with fighter air escort, see? until this aircraft was developed. This is the North American P-51 Mustang, the D model. And with extra tanks, the P-51, which was an excellent fighter plane, could fly with our bombers all the way to Germany and back. It, was, it made all the difference. Of course, here's Rosie the Riveter. Uh, this isn't a Pratt and Windy engine, engine. This looks like a Wright Cyclone engine of the type that was used in a B-17. Great picture, isn't it? And here is a B-17G. The G model designates the last model of the B-17 because the Luftwaffe dis discovered that the weakest part of a B-17 formation was if they flew out of the sun right at you. And that's why they added this, what they call the chin turret right there. So we couldn't shoot straight forward at the German Air Force as they were trying to shoot at you. And here is a Rosie the Riveter who was like lovingly um, ratcheting down the seat that was going to be used for the bombardier who was going to be using the Norden bombsite. And this you have this plexiglass surface on the nose bubble, by the way. And notice that this triangular shape in right in the front is actually flat. And the reason why that's flat is so that the bomber can look straight out and not have it have the distortive effect of a curved piece of plastic. You see, that's why that flat piece is there. 
And here's the 24 Liberator. All of these have the Norden bomb site, right? Here's the 15th Air Force. The 8th Air Force flew out of Great Britain um, and the 15th Air Force, once we had moved from North Africa in the Mediterranean campaign, right, as a result of Operation Torch in November of 1942, by 1943, we were, if you've ever seen the movie Patton, and you probably have if you're watching my show here today, um, we moved over from Tunisia to um, Sicily. And then from Sicily across the Straits of Messina onto the Italian boot proper. And then once we had Southern Italy, then you were able to have um, enough flat land where you can actually make, you can actually host an entire air force there. And that happened to be the American 15th Air Force flying liberators. And then so what they would do now, you'd have the B-17s flying out of, um, um, Great Britain, and then the, the B-24s would fly up over the Alps, right, and into Germany and into Austria. And that's what they're doing. I don't know, you can't really see it in this photograph, but they're flying over the Alps. And here is a, here's a group of, you know, the, the essential aircraft right, the B-17 Flying Fortress. All these airplanes were extraordinarily rugged. It's just amazing the kind of damage they could take and still come home. Uh, it, I mean, really, I've got some photographs for you that you just won't believe. And in every one of these aircraft is Norden's secret bomb site. every one of them. There it is. That's what it looks like. You know, so it's like an autopilot and it's a automatic torpedo data computer that's designed to calculate every possible variable that could be accounted for in the dropping of a bomb. It, it is an incredible piece of machinery, absolutely incredible. And if you were the bombardier, Right, and you you land your aircraft. The B, the this thing has to be unfastened from the airplane, covered, and then carried off by you to make sure that nobody on the field or whatever it is can sneak into the airplane and start taking pictures of something. This thing had to be looked at and be accounted for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You couldn't leave it there. It couldn't be unattended. It had to be covered when it was being moved. And here's the whole, this is what the whole thing's about, right? This is a camera that is set in the bomb bay right, in this case of a B-24 Liberator. And they're, they've come up from over the Alps from Italy and they're dropping a stick of bombs, right? See, so, you know, your aircraft is traveling several hundred miles an hour, right? You've got wind drift, you've got all kinds of stuff going on here that all has to be accounted for. Your altitude, right, and the higher you are, it just, it compounds whatever other variable there is because it has longer time for the bombs to be affected by whatever those variables are, right? And um, what's exploding on the bottom is a German aircraft plant. You know, so this picture here is good to uh, show you and talk about one of the basic differences of the strategy that the Americans had vis-a-vis -vis the, the British. The British, Sir Arthur, Bomber Harris, right, became a bit of a pariah by the end of the war because he was essentially ruthless in bombing, carpet bombing entire swaths of cities, you see. And the rationale was that what is the difference if you kill the German who's operating a machine that's making a piece of war, right? You know, an airplane, uh, a munition, whatever it is. So that would be a legitimate military target while his hand was there on the machine. But somehow while that same guy went home 
and is now having dinner with his wife and then goes to sleep, right? According to Arthur Harris, you could just bomb him to bits while he was sleeping and that's still a military target, you see? So you've got kind of like a philosophical, ethical um, equation going on here about, well, you know, I mean, it's according to Sir Arthur Harris, I mean, if you kill the guy while he's sleeping, isn't it just as effective? I mean, he's not coming to work tomorrow. So, you know, so what's the difference between hitting him while he's in his bed or on the toilet or if he's standing there with his hand on the machine, you see? So you, and this has never been solved. People are still like arguing about this stuff now, right? And, but the Americans, and like I told you before, I mean, it's true. We lost our innocence or our moral high ground with what I'm about to tell you when we started burning Japanese to death over in Japan, okay? Um, we were after the military targets, right? We're gonna bomb submarine manufacturing bases and um, shipyards and Messerschmitt factories, right? And everywhere that we know that, and, and um, power plants, oil refineries, synthetic oil refineries, right? All the rest of that, you see? And if you could do that on target, that was good. That's what the Norden bomb site was for. So here is a synthetic fuel factory in Germany. It's something that the Germans were, you know, their technology was just incredible, frankly, in this regard from the standpoint of their chemists. You know, they were taking coal and turning it into lubricating oil and into fuel that you can use in engines. So here is a B-17 that is underneath the aircraft that is dropping the bombs. And of course, this had to be staggered just right or else you'd be dropping the bomb on the aircraft underneath you. You can imagine the kind of nerve that this takes. This is what this photograph is about over here, you see. So this aircraft, then this photograph is taken from the bomb bay of the aircraft above it. And what happened was either the aircraft that's taking the picture or the aircraft that we're looking at is out of position. And what has happened is that the stick of bombs from the aircraft that's taking the photograph has actually torn off the entire port horizontal stabilizer and elevated. See it in the photograph? I mean, it's just amazing, right? And, oh, and here's another bomb in mid-flight, if you can see it right over here with my arrow. See that? I mean, this is just incredible stuff. I mean, absolutely incredible. Right, and the Germans, of course, are just blasting away at this the whole time, right? There's an old saying, we say this in psychology or politics and everything else like that. You know, it's kind of like when you're attacking your political opponents, you know, and then all of a sudden they're letting you have it back with all that they have. You know that you're getting into a soft spot because the targets that need to be protected are protected more, you see? So, it, so if you're getting shot at more, after you fly over a certain spot, you know there's something valuable down here. And it's the same, you can apply that to psychology and sociology too, right? If you're talking to somebody and you get into a subject that all of a sudden they're extraordinarily angry and all of a sudden they're trying to destroy you, you know that you're over the target, if you see my point. And this is what flak looks like when you're in the aircraft. Like I said, the things are fused to explode after a certain timed flight and it's a mathematical computation, right? If an aircraft is flying at 21,000 feet, then you know that the shell is gonna be fired and it's gonna be traveling at a certain velocity. It is strictly a math of mathematical computation to figure out how, where to set the fuse, see? And they explode. And they're designed to break into a bunch of parts so that those parts can cause as much damage as possible, even if it doesn't hit you. Take a look at this. There is a B-26 Marauder, one of the airplanes I featured last week in our study of Pratt & Whitney, right? And there is a Pratt & Whitney R-2600 still turning after it's been blown off the airplane, you see, after taking a direct hit from German anti-aircraft fire. 
Isn't this incredible? I mean, the pictures are just phenomenal. I mean, it, and you would have to imagine that as a young man, I mean, even as the commander of the aircraft, you're like, what, 21 years old, 22 years old? I mean, if somebody was 30 years old here, you were grandpa, you know? And here's a 17, look at this, the entire front of the aircraft up to the ball turret has been completely blown off. Five people bailed out, which means that five other people are dead inside the airplane. Here's an airplane that actually made it back. See, isn't that incredible? So the front of the airplane takes a direct hit and you can see how the whole aircraft is blown to pieces, right? And by incidentally, by the way, this is this is where the Fort Norden bomb site is, right over here where my arrow is. And there's the bombardier seat right over there. You see it? This is where the bombardier sits, and that's where the Norden bomb site is, right? So this aircraft trick takes this direct hit. Here's a 50 caliber machine gun hanging there um, by its ammo belt. Uh, and then they were able to, somebody was able to fly this airplane back and land it. Isn't that incredible? Here's another um, bunch of people back on the ground who are examining this B-17, right? So you can see that the port side, uh, the, the uh, following a, a section of the wing, right, where the flaps are, and where the gas tank is and everything else like that is completely blown to bits. And even with this structural damage, the aircraft was able, still able to be navigated home. Here's the tail end of another B-17. So you had the tail gunner here who was blown to atoms, I assume. And the entire back of the aircraft is just completely been blown to bits, including the rudder. Right, the rudder, there's the port side horizontal stabilizer, right, and the elevator, right, where you control the pitch of the aircraft up and down. It's just amazing. Right, I like this picture. This is a great picture. It's a B 24 Liberator that's taken a shot right through the wing, right, right behind one of the engines, you see. And here is one of the crew members who was expressing his, uh, shall we say, gratitude that the aircraft was built as well as it was or on sheer luck or both. Can you imagine? Yeah, right. And here's the primary type of aircraft that the, that the Germans had that were meeting us over um, trying to interrupt, trying to interrupt and knock our, like you got the bombardier who's got to concentrate on what he's doing. And you think, I mean, what kind of nerve do you have to have to not get rattled when at any moment you might get blown out of the sky or shot through the head or whatever it was. And it's not like these airplanes, the B-17s or 24s were like armor plated or something like that. When you get strafed with bullets, then, you know, chances are you were just going to get hit, you know, I mean, aircraft aluminum is not that thin, right? And this is a, uh, a BF-109, right, which was a very formidable aircraft that the, uh, that the Germans were using as fighters, right? And here's a great picture. This is somebody in where the waste gunner is on the, that's in the, after the wing, you had a, a machine gun location on the port and starboard side, the left and right side of the aircraft. And that uh, person, uh, I mean, if that was them, I'd be dropping the camera right about now and, and grabbing my 50 caliber machine gun, if you know what I mean. And see the, the, one, the 109 right over here on the right side? It's incredible. Here's another airplane that the Germans were using, once again, with a radial engine, like we were talking about last time with Pratt and Whitney, right? These radial engines were made by um, BMW. And it's a Focke Wolf 190, which was probably the best fighter airplane the Germans had. You know, I mean, that of a piston engine design, that is. The Germans also produced the first jet aircraft. 
This is a guy who was in charge of the fighters for the Germans, uh, Adolf Galland, uh, who got in trouble with the Nazi hierarchy all the time because he told them that they were idiots. Okay, and you know, that's not something you do in the Nazi hierarchy. There's what the tail gunner looks like on the B-17. The waist gunners, right? Notice that they're wearing these heavy fleece outfits uh, with leather and it's electrically heated inside, right? You had to plug yourself in to the power of the air crane. So you had these electric heaters. It was like a big electric blanket, you know? It's about 25 degrees below zero at 20,000 feet, right? Depending on the time of the year. You see, and there's no air up there either. None of these airplanes had pressurized or heated cabins, right? So the ambient temperature and the ambient atmospheric pressure was that outside the airplane as it was inside the airplane, right? So one of the ways you could get killed here, you didn't have to get hit by a machine gun bullet from some aircraft or a piece of flak. If one of the bullets or the pieces of flak severed your electrical connection to the electricity of the airplane, then you'd freeze to death. Or if it went through your oxygen supply system, well, then you wouldn't be able to breathe. Right? So here these guys get back to base and they're actually, here's a dead fellow laying on the deck inside the B-17. Right, and by the end of the war, they had to put machine guns like everywhere, everywhere. And uh, so here's actually the radio operator who's actually dropped his radio and he's like shooting outside the airplane. Now, Baltart, right, this was a precarious position. He's underneath the airplane, right, underneath the airplane in this fully articulating ball. Right, you had to find, this was like a special thing to do, right? You didn't just grab somebody and throw them in there. They had to be psychologically able to be in that combined space that if they were shot at or the aircraft was in distress, chances are if there wasn't somebody to help them, they wouldn't be able to get out of there, right? That takes a special kind of nerve, right? You see the fellow in there? This is something else, man. <clears throat> um, this is some of the fighter airplanes that we had that were escorting these B-17s, B-47 Thunderbolts. I talked about that last week when we did Pratt & Whitney, right? There's R-2800 double cyclones in there. Very formidable aircraft. You wouldn't want to be on the wrong end of this thing. Uh, when, if you were on the ground, this, this, these aircraft annihilated troop convoys and trains and, and, and any kind of procession that the Germans were using trying to get out of France, etc. cetera. Um, P-38 Thunderbolt. Uh, this aircraft was using um, a V-style Allison engine, right? Hence, you could tell by the nar more narrow uh, engine nacelles. Uh, this is, these are early P-51 Mustangs, right? These are like Razorbacks, right? Before they had the bubble canopy, right? So you can tell the difference between the early ones and the later ones. And the Germans, um, you know, they had in late 1944 or early 1945, they had introduced into service the first operational jet fighter, uh, the Messerschmitt 262. Right, and this was very, very difficult to shoot down, of course, because it was traveling like 600 miles an hour. Although we did shoot some down with our piston engine aircraft, okay? Uh, but it was too little, it was too late. And the Germans got even more desperate and they came up with these nutty things, right? This one here is a Messerschmitt 163, which is essentially a flying rocket, right? You had a guy sitting in there and it was just a flying rocket. And it had these two cannons on it. So this thing, they would they would shoot this thing and it would fly straight up towards a formation of, I don't know, let's say they're B-20, uh, B-17s. And there was nothing anybody could do about it that was moving so fast. And it would just launch these huge cannon fire and 
then the whole thing was over, right? And then it was out of fuel. And then they would just sort of like scoop back down to the ground and land it on its belly. It's, um, you know, the Germans had a lot of stuff in the last year of the war. I could do an entire six part programming on the, on the, on the, what they called the secret weapons, the vengeance weapons, the high technology stuff. It was very important that Germany be defeated uh, because had the war been able to go on another year, they may literally have had the technology to actually turn things around, you see. It is very real stuff. Here's a bunch of 24s in the middle of a bomb run using the Norden bomb site. Now, these crews, they came off of the aircraft when they were done, absolutely exhausted, as you might imagine. They went straight to a briefing uh, for those who were in the operational aspects of flying the aircraft or as observers. And all of the gunners, uh, it was their job to disassemble all of the guns on the aircraft and strip them down and clean them and everything else and oil them up and make sure that they were in good condition and put them back on the aircraft. You know, and all too often, this is what you, your loved ones wound up at home with, right? Uh, Secretary of War desires me to express his deep, right? You know, condolences, regret that your son, Sergeant, I took the word out, I took the person's name out. I didn't think that was necessary. Has been reporting missing in action, right? How many of these went out? Here's a crazy picture I found. I mean, I don't, I, I can't even believe it, right? So there's a lot of unexploded bombs around. You know, they're still finding unexploded bombs around in Europe, right? Italy, Germany, Holland, all the rest of those places, right? So in this crazy scene over here, what you've got is they took these, um, I assume they're Jews, right? But maybe not even Jews from German concentration camps. And they gave these prisoners special conditions if they would volunteer to go out and defuse unexploded bombs. How about that? I mean, I guess kind of like they're going to kill you anyway, right? Think about this for a minute, right? And this is all absolutely real. You know, you might as well go in and, and maybe it would be merciful if one of the damn bombs blew up and you wouldn't have to go back to the concentration camp. I mean, think about this for a minute. So as the strategic bombing effort went on and increased with the Americans and our precision bombing of aircraft factories and fuel factories and secondary um, mechanical plants and tertiary mechanical plants, right? What the Germans did, and this is all Albert Speer, by the way. I, I wonder if you know who that is. He was in charge of armaments by this point. You know, he was Hitler's favorite architect. But now that the war was becoming desperate, uh, Hitler put the person he trusted as far as his intellect was concerned and making sure that Germany could actually continue producing weapons of war, despite the fact that the allies had this very, very successful bombing campaign to destroy industry that was above ground. So what Albert Speer did was he commandeered every underground mine shaft, railroad tunnel that wasn't being used, anything at all. And he made these little factories that were out of sight for the bombers and the Norton bomb site. Right? So here you have an underground Focke Wolf 190 assembly plant, right? So you had people manufacturing all of these sub assemblies for the Focke Wolf, and then they would sneak them over to this tunnel, and then they would assemble them. And it, the whole thing had to be done in clandestine. And as a matter of fact, you wouldn't think that this would be the case, but Albert Speer actually increased production in 1944. I mean, it was really amazing. And here is where they're putting together these uh, Messerschmitt 262 jet bombers. And by this point over here, they were able to manufacture the bombers in these remote locations, but they, they had to hide them in the forest out of sight from our aircraft because we had so annihilated their fuel supply that they didn't have the jet fuel to fly them. 
So here's a shot of the Autobahn, right? The famous German Autobahn. And you can see what the Germans have done here is they've actually stuck these Messerschmitt 262s, right? They've moved them back into the trees, you see? And because they were waiting parts, they were waiting fuel, you see? We had finally, by the beginning of 1945, so disrupted their supply chain um, that, you know, you maybe you can put the airplane together, but if you don't have this part, it's not gonna fly. You see, though the airplane was useless. And what they were hoping to do here was that once they were able to get whatever missing parts there were or fuel, then they would just launch the aircraft right from the Autobahn. That's why they chose this. And we are hitting the refineries, right? No oil, no war machine, right? No gasoline, no lubricating oil, no synthetic oil, right? Always a big thing. This isn't a, an oil refine. This isn't an oil field like Ploetsky. This is in Romania. This is actually a, one of the refineries happens to be in Hamburg. And we plastered this completely with B-17s, B-24s, and the Norden bombsite. Now, here's another one. You know, so this is Dresden, and this was at, at later on in the war. And it, Dresden is like a medieval city, and it had a lot of people in it who were refugees from other cities that um, had fled, you know, from the annihilation that we brought from the air, both the British and the Americans. And the German Sir Arthur Harris decided that he was going to fry, and I mean fry, Nuremberg. Right, it's a medieval city, tremendous amount of architectural history, all the rest of that, a lot of civilians um, fleeing from various places into this city. You know, so I guess you could make an argument that anything that was still under German control was a military target, right? But once again, we're getting into kind of like this ethical semantics here, right? And I don't, I'm not here to tell you what to think. I mean, you can make your, your mind about this sort of a thing. But the United States Air Force did follow up the next morning with daylight bombing and filled, and we bombed Dresden too. You know? part of the legacy of this whole thing. So the end of the war is there. And um, the Norden bombsite is a big part of it. Uh, obviously not such a much a secret anymore, but still, like I said, until you have laser guided bombs, right? I mean, now if we're, you know, we, we, we can hit things with drones now, you know, so which means that you, you know, you have one reconnaissance drone that locates somebody. And then it actually, you've got to have it be able to paint the target with a radio signal, either from the ground or from an aircraft, you see, another drone. And then you can actually launch what we call a Hellfire missile and it will hit whatever it is that's painted with that signal, you see. And, um, and literally, I mean, you could, you know, you, if somebody's sitting on the toilet reading the newspaper, you can just, the, the, the missile will fly right through the bathroom window and kill them. See what I mean? Back in these days over here, you had this wide, like I said, the British were using carpet bombing, right? Like as if you were to take carpet that was rolled up and then unroll it, you see? So, you know, you wound up hitting everything. And from a psychological aspect of things, what happened was that when the lead airplane drops the bombs, this, the, you can imagine the adrenaline that's running in these 20 year olds, these 19 year olds, these 22 year olds flying these airplanes and being the bombardiers. I mean, as soon as you see the airplane in front of you dropping their bombs, you start dropping your bombs. So what happens is that you wind up with this line of aircraft where you're not even getting to the target. People are dropping the bombs when the aircraft in front of you was dropping their bombs. You see, it's just a psychological thing. It's, it's, you're not in a level of panic, but let's just say you want to get the hell out of there. Right. And uh, that's one of the things that the Norton mom site was there to help prevent was that kind of a human error. Right. On some of the British raids. I mean, you know, the joke was that they were famous for another great day for destroying German agriculture. Right. Because essentially they 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 let their bombs go ahead of the city, which they were trying to hit. And they, they killed a bunch of cows right out in a field somewhere. You see. 
um, it was notoriously inaccurate. Um, so, and also, like I said, you know, we had had, we, the United States had sort of like the moral upper higher ground with this whole bombing in, in thing, because, you know, it was us, unlike Sir Arthur Harris, we were interested in the military targets. We wanted to hit the factory. We wanted to hit the refinery. We wanted to hit the armory, the shipyard, something like that. But Curtis LeMay, who was, you know, one of the people who was there, um, was sent over to the Pacific Theater and um, the B-29s that we were using, which were never used in Europe, by the way, still using the Norton bombsite, however, right? The B-29s were supposed to be an aircraft that could be further range than the B-17, and it was. And the, B and the, B the B-29 um, the Super Fortress was the first aircraft that had a pressurized cabin, right? And a heated cabin, right? So in other words, you had oxygen, you could breathe and you had heat and you had pressure. So you weren't in the same situation as a B-17 freezing your butt off up there. And if your oxygen line got shut off, you were going to asphyxiate. You see, so the 29, they were going to fly at high altitude and bomb Japan, but even the Norden bomb site couldn't do it because you had these, I know there's a word for it over there, it, the trade winds that go over Japan. I know, I know there's a word for that, that climate feature. Um, the jet stream, is it the jet stream? Is that what I'm talking about? You know. So anyway, you would drop the bombs from, I don't know, 30,000 feet and they wind up like in the Pacific Ocean, you know? So it was a whole waste of time. And then the B-29 had to fly in like at 8,000 feet, which was crazy for a B-29, you know? And, but you wanted to be able to hit the targets. And we used incendiary bombs in Japan and we were killing hundreds of thousands of Japanese every single week with these incendiary bombs. We had learned in Germany how to create something called a firestorm, right? Now this is very sinister stuff, right? So you create a firestorm, we learned this in places like Dresden. If you create a mass of heat in the center of a city that gets burning so hot, I'm talking about like a thousand degrees hot, okay? Then what happens is like, do you ever use a fireplace at home, right? And you're supposed to like crack a window on the other side of the room, you see? And then there's something called convection, right? Where the cool air comes in and it, and it goes to the bottom of the fire. And because the heat rises, it pulls the air in from the bottom, you see? And then it gets burned and then goes up in the form of heat. Right? So, and up the chimney. You see, so when you create a firestorm, what happens is literally you're creating a tornado of wind across the city towards the center that essentially stokes this fire. And people are incinerated into ash. And the Japanese cities, the Japanese cities are typically made out of, unless it's a modern epicenter, they're made out of wood. So Curtis LeMay kind of took on the tactics of Sir Arthur Harris, you might say. And, um, you know, the Japanese weren't surrendering anyway. So, you know, but it's up until the point of August 6th, 1945. And then of course, August 9th, 1945 respectively we had atomic bomb number one, right? Which is called the little boy, which is a uranium bomb. And then you had fat man, which was atomic bomb number two, which was called an implosion plutonium bomb, right? Both of them sighted on their targets, right? At Hiroshima and Nagasaki respectively with the Norden bomb site. And um, we dropped the two atomic bombs in quick succession 
for psychological reasons, right? Uh, so it turns out we only had like three of them, right? And we wanted to make it seem like we had a whole stack of these things, right? So that's why we dropped them in quick succession, you see, because we wanted the Japanese to think that if they don't surrender, then we're just going to bomb the hell out of them every couple of days until they do surrender or there's nothing left, you see? And it's psychological warfare. And um, well, that's my story of the Norden bomb site for you. Um, I, I thought the best way to give credence to Mr. Norden would be to kind of like put this in context for you and see how important this all was. You know, uh, you know, in retrospect, you can see that there are controversial aspects of it. It's certainly not Mr. Norden's fault that people thought that Sir Arthur Harris was a, you know, a sadist or something like that, or insert word here, all right? Um, it's just another interesting aspects of military history, these other discussions that I like to bring in an ancillary point. Um, but that is what, when you think of Norden, that's what you think of. In other regards, Norden, especially here in Connecticut, became, you know, a, a subcontractor and a a subcontractor and a subcontractor, all of these crazy technical things that really I don't think anybody would have much interest in. Uh, this was what Norden was remembered for, the famous Mark 15 Norden bombsite. So I want to thank you for joining me in this series today uh, and for the uh, previous sessions. Uh, I certainly have enjoyed my time with you. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we split? Yes, does anyone have any questions or comments they'd like to share? I don't see anything on the chat. May I ask one? Of course. Sure, Mr. Gottlieb, I'm hoping that you'll do a series on the early American wars before the uh, French and Indian War, King William's War, Queen <laughs> Anne's War. Okay. Is that to commemorate the passing of QE2? <laughs> 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 no, I'm just joking. So uh, yes, okay, thank you. That's what I need to hear, what people want. Now, I usually work that out with the library to see what they want, you know, and not only that, but, it, but, but to, to the, you know, another word to the friends, thank you, thank you. And so, you know, I usually come up with some proposals and I run them by the friends and the friends actually make the choice about what they want me to do, okay? So I'd be glad to put that forward for you as well. Your, your series have been superb. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It means so much to me. Um, anybody else? Oh, we do have one in the chat. Art is, says, uh, can you do your presentation on Amelia Earhart? Sure. You know, like I said, um, um, I'm working in conjunction with the library. So whatever you guys want to put together, I mean, if you want to put together a series of biographical, you know, profiles, of somebody like Amelia Earhart, uh, it, it would be awesome. I would love to do it. Amelia Earhart, um, Charles Lindbergh, right? Any of them, all of them, I'm in. I would do this every day with you if I had my <laughs> druthers. I really, I would. Um, you know, for me, for me, it is, um, you know, the, what I like to do is in, um, instead of just, crunching on a lot of the technical minutia of something, you know, what, what, what I felt to be the better thing to do is to actually put a personality or um, an item in context so that we understand the importance of the event or the importance of the person, or what it meant at the time. And, and I hope that's a, what I've been able to do for you. It's been very nice. Thank you, Art. Yep. All right. As a matter of fact, tonight in Darien, I am doing a program on Queen Elizabeth II. So, <laughs> and uh, that is something that is uh, certainly in the news. All right, guys. So um, I'm going to step off if that's it. Yeah, um, that seems to be it. I just want to, again, like you said, Art, I want to thank the Friends of the Library for making this series possible with you. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for this series. Uh, the next series with Art, uh, he will be presenting uh, The Cold War, A Historical Perspective. 
And the first of that series begins Wednesday, October 12th at 2 p.m. Registration is open right now, so you can go on our website, ewml.org, or you can call our reference desk at 203-452-2850 uh, if you'd like to join. You only have to register once for the entire series. Um, thank you, Art, and thank you all again, and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.